from Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joel Mitchell. How are you, Joel? Well, um, this is our first podcast recording since you got back, isn't it? Oh, together. Yeah, together, yeah. I've done a couple of other podcasts and webinars and other things. Such a big wig. <laughs> there is one, that's one way of, of describing <laughs> what I do. Yeah. yeah, that's that's, you know, I'm just being polite. I don't think you are. Politer than I could yeah, be. Yeah, you're politer than what you normally would be. Yeah. We'll, we'll put it that way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, no, it is. It is um, it's is. been a month between drinks for us. Mm. Um, we did do one when I was in London. We did. Um, that was just the two of us. Yes. Mm. So, um, you know, it's our first proper Psych Health and Safety podcast recording. Since it is. Back. Here we are in the room together. Yeah. So, we should probably introduce our guests then. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, we're not going to talk and catch up because um, that could go for a while. And we have two guests on today. We do. And we really want to get into this because it's a very topical thing, you could say. Yes. Great. All yeah. right. So um, of the two guests, one is a returning guest with a background as a clinical psychologist in occupational rehabilitation. The other is a member of the board of advisors for the Healthy Heads in Truck and Sheds Foundation and a citizen advocate for the Safety Governance Foundation. They are both here today representing Safe Work New South Wales. Welcome to the podcast, State Inspector Ian Firth and Director of Health and Safe Design, Jim Kelly. Hey guys. Thank you. Thanks for Yeah. So, um, Ian, you're a repeat visitor uh, on the uh, on the podcast. This will be your third appearance, if I'm counting correctly. Yes. Uh, thank you for having me back. Uh, I'm not sure what you were thinking for a third time, but I, but I do appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's just you guys in New South Wales, right? Just doing so much from, uh, you know, code of practice, regulation, reform um, perspective. It's um, really leading the way. Um, really looking forward to unpacking that. And uh, Jim, you know, first time, um, you know, we, uh, you know, your reputation precedes you, as I said, off air. And, you know, we do see you doing some really great things, getting out there and really pushing the message around systemic approaches to, to workplace mental health. So, yeah, really great to have you on for a first time. Yeah, thanks, Jason and Joelle. It's a real privilege to be here with all the distinguished speakers you've had over over the extended period of time now. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, don't let that deter you. I mean, Joel and I speak on here every day, so. We do. And we're, we're about as um, in, distinguished. In, indistinguished. <laughs> Distinguishable. <laughs> um, all right. So, Jim, what podcast do you like to listen to at the moment? Yeah, I jump around a bit, Joel. I'm probably not such a loyal listener to one or two podcasts, but I do jump around following, often following the speakers and wherever they turn up. Um, the one that really comes to mind for me is really um, the, the Work Life podcast that Adam Grant does. Um, it's a TED-based one out of America, um, organisational psychologist. So um, really interesting to see what's happening in the States and, and how they're looking at um, that, the whole concept of, uh, of work and life and flexibility and, and, and organisational changes. It's, it's always fascinating. So that's one that... That more recently I've been giving a bit of time to. Um, but other than that, really like to tune into um, other areas too, not just in the, in the work, health and safety space. So sometimes whatever the top topic might be, um, property, investing or um, true crime sometimes. You know, it's, 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 yeah, I like to mix it up a bit. I think um, everybody in Australia likes a bit of true, uh, true crime podcasting. Yeah, I've, tried, I've, tried a little, I've tried a little bit, not as much as what you get into it. Like your I, favorite I don't, no. And... I, I just, I was listening to that one, like, and it was, just um, not good for me, so I've stopped listening to to that now. So that's they okay. can hook you in, can't they? There's, there's, yeah. There's little, so I don't. Yeah, I'll be very selective on which I choose, but um, but yeah, some catch you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But Adam Grant does a great podcast. He we does. still have an open call out. So Adam, when you're ready, if you can just reach out, that would be terrific. Yeah. He definitely listens every week. Yeah. To us, we'll get him on. I'm sure he does. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Ian, any podcasts from you? Uh, look, I, I haven't recently. I think um, other than this podcast, this is probably the one professionally that I um, pick pick up on the most and it's probably Good the way man. that it's – Yeah, I, I think – This is why it's back for a third time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you like how it's done, Jim. <laughs> 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 
yeah, this is how you do it, Jim. You just, uh, you know, start with a compliment. And yeah, um, yeah. now I've, <laughs> I've actually um, been on leave, a uh, little bit of driving with the family. So I've probably tuned into more uh, audio books than um, mm. podcasts over the last few weeks. So, yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, now, Ian, we've um, heard about your professional career previously. So we might just um, ask Jim if uh, we can have a, an overview of your career, please. Yeah, similar in, in some ways to, to Ian's and, and others in this space, I suppose. I started as an occupational therapist and went straight into work-related rehabilitation. Um, kind of got um, a little bit sick of dealing with the after effects of injury and illness in the workplace and so moved across to OHS prevention with a bit of study and, um, and looking at uh, early intervention when it comes to um, both MSDs and mental health, which are the two big, big ticket items that I deal with. Um, and then the opportunity came up to, um, to work in and out of human resources at, at different times of the career. Um, Almost had a bit of a junction there. We had to choose between going down the HR management path or or stick with health and safety. And my passion was very much in the health and safety space. So um, fortunately, a position came up with a regulator. This is about probably 15 or so years ago now, almost 20 years ago, um, leading a team of inspectors. So that's when I jumped across to regulation and, and never looked back, really. There's been lots of variety and, and opportunities with the regulator over those years to, to lead a number of different teams. And Unfortunately, I'm back to kind of where I started in terms of leading return to work and um, MSDs and mental health and um, ergonomics and uh, return to work is a big part of our, our directorate because we, we uh, look after workers' compensation obligations on behalf of the insurance regulator. So yeah, it's, it's kind of done full circle in terms of career, but uh, very much loving the prevention space. And are you finding that your approach now um, to return to work has changed um, over the years and I guess based on the um, the different experiences and learnings that you've had through that time? It certainly has, but I think industry has, broadly speaking, I think um, everyone's looking at, at recovery at work and, the, and the, uh, such an important piece of the puzzle in terms of uh, work can be good for you, um, but if you stay connected to the workplace and, and recover at the workplace, um, when work is, is designed to be healthy and safe, um, the outcomes are fantastic. Uh, but similarly, we also kind of realised more recently that um, encouraging or even forcing people back into a workplace that's not healthy for them can be detrimental as well. So um, that's a, a bit of a, um, a watershed moment for us to really realise that recovery at work needs to be the priority, but it has to be in a healthy and safe work environment. Yeah, and there's especially with psych hazards, um, returning somebody to a workplace without addressing the psych hazards is just, yeah, you're just going to re-injure them all over again. Well, physical hazards as well, because we know secondary psych issues are such a problem in the physical space. So it goes hand in hand. Um, really important part of it. Yeah, uh, important work. And um, like I said, great stuff that you guys are doing. And on that note, I guess um, you obviously have the New South Wales Mentally Healthy Workplaces strategy over there. Um, Jim, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I know your listeners have probably heard a little bit about it over the years. It's um, We're at the end of a five-year journey on our strategy, really, back in 2017, we, we, we had political buy-in and, and a willingness to take on workplace mental health. And, and out of that, uh, we developed the mental health and workplaces strategy. Uh, we set out um, to get a bit of a benchmark of where we we're at in terms of New South Wales' capability to create a, a mentally healthy work environment. And, and Ian and I worked with um, some of the best academics in the country, and, and we still pinch ourselves today <laughs> about how good those guys were at the time um, in terms of helping us define what a mentally healthy workplace really is and how would you measure a scale, I suppose, of, of building capability to become a mentally healthy workplace. So that was our benchmarking tool. That's really where it started. Um, we did a sampling and, and realised that we've got a lot of work to do. Um, something like 70% of businesses were, were, were doing next to nothing. If, if they were, it was very much a reactive uh, approach. So they might have an EAP program, but not much else. So we use that to benchmark our work and then and design our strategy. And, and since then, we've been raising awareness and, and building capability through um, partnerships like the Black Dog Institute, where we've, we've provided free training for small and many businesses, for example. Uh, we've experimented with a couple of different coaching services, but we currently have a coaching program now where um, a small and many business can pick up the phone and talk to an organisational psychologist uh, and really get tailored advice to their business uh, about anything in the mental health space. And that really helps them make that first step whether it be someone's disclosed to illness in the workplace or, or whether they want to develop an action plan to, to go down that path. But we've also got extensive resources on our website so that people can have a kind of self-service channel and self-service option. And, and as part of that, we've developed a number of online tools as well so that businesses can actually take 
um, a self-assessment approach uh, to identify where the gaps are and where they can really develop their, their capability and action plan. But what we also realised as part of our strategic approach was um, obviously as a regulator, we needed to define what compliance looks like because everyone's on a different scale. There's, there's best practice in terms of a mentally healthy work environment. But we also needed to define what the minimum expectations were as a regulator. And we know that health and safety legislation always referred to health and health includes psychological health, but there wasn't much else beyond that. So that's really where the, the idea that um, the code of practice came from. Um, strategically, we needed to, to better define what compliance looks like. And, and I called on Ian to help us really design and craft up the, the first code of practice, which we, we are really proud of. So um, there's obviously been a ton of time and resources put into the strategy and all the resources and other bits and pieces that you have developed as, as an organisation. Um, what, If we go back a few steps, what really prompted the New South Wales government to put that kind of investment and make that um, decision to focus so heavily on, on mental health in the workplace? Why, why not just leave it to you know the public health um, domain? Yeah, a great question. And really the workers' conversation um, drivers were, were the big, big ticket item for us. Um, a number of things have to have to align, I suppose, when you're, when you're working for government and you're working with, with regulation. And, and obviously um, the number of big drivers for us is obviously fatalities in the workplace get front, front and centre. And, and obviously that's something we've always had to compete with, with illness and disease type um, factors like mental health or, or ergonomics. They don't really hit the front page of the paper um, too often. Um, they don't necessarily associate workplace psychological hazards with, with um, fatalities. And, and obviously, suicide is a big factor, but that's probably more prevalent now than what it was five years ago in terms of drawing that connection. Um, so for us, workers' conversation is the other big believer that motivates government and motivates regulators. Um, and we could see over time, over the last 10 years or so, a, a general trend of increasing the cost and duration and, and frequency of, of psychological claims. So that was a bit of the driver. Um, on top of that, we had a, a relatively new minister uh, with a personal passion and interest in mental health. And, and when we found that, um, that created the, the impetus, I suppose, for us to, to do something to support that the, the government of the day that we serve and the minister at the time. Uh, and that enabled us to really get the buy-in and, and the investment that we needed to kickstart a strategy like this. Um, Jim, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, you have uh, updated the stats. I remember there was some pretty compelling statistics uh, when the draft code of practice came out regarding that, as you're talk, referring to that uh, change or increase in workers' compensation claims uh, for psychological injury, as well as the complexity and cost of, of those claims. Um, have you seen or um, gotten any new data since the pandemic um, uh, and whether there's been a change in those numbers? We've certainly been looking at it closely and I had to appear for a parliamentary inquiry this week actually, so it was something that was front and centre. Mm. Um, there's, there's challenges with workers' compensation data, as many of your listeners would, would recognise, that there's a significant lag. Um, obviously, a claim that's um, lodged perhaps in June this year, for example, may take two or three years before it's closed, and, and you can't necessarily measure the cost of duration until you see the closure of the claims. So for that reason, the last two or three years, you, you've got to take the cost and duration at least with, with, um, with some sort of... Um, what's the right word, I suppose? You've got to look at it in context of the fact that the, the clients are still active and live. Mm. Uh, if you look at incident numbers, we've seen some sort of positive indication in the last year or two, um, but noting the fact that there's often a delay when insurers put forward their, their, their batch reporting that they do to the insurance regulator. Um, but we haven't seen a, a significant spike is what you might have anticipated around the pandemic, which is really reassuring. Um, the spike we did see was in the physical space where COVID-related um, claims came through and, and in New South Wales anyway, um, COVID illness was, was um, a workers' compensation claim for a, a number of workplaces regardless of whether there was evidence to support it coming from the workplace or not. So that was a substantial spike. We also saw a number of frontline workers like emergency services um, experiencing a lot of anxiety around um, COVID. So we saw a spike as re in relation to that. Um, that aligned with obviously the prevalence of COVID in the workplace. But we haven't necessarily seen other spikes in other areas, which is really reassuring. The other thing which has been really reassuring for us in terms of we're heading on the right track is we've done that uh, benchmarking tool that I mentioned at the start of the strategy two more times. We did it um, at the midpoint, which was around about 2020, so the, the pandemic had just started to kick off about nine months into it. And then we did it again this year. And Whilst I haven't got the final report just yet, the early indication is that we've exceeded our targets. So we set out 
for 90,000 businesses to be taking effective action. And we defined that in our five tier scale. Um, at the time, we thought that was a bit ambitious. That's about 10% of all workplaces in, in New South Wales. And, uh, and we knew we had a long way to go. Um, but the early indications from our surveys that we hit about 92,000 um, businesses. So we're really pleased to see that because they're lead indicators that they're actually taking really positive steps to, um, to create that mentally healthy work environment. And we have confidence that over time, we'll see that um, return results in the, in the workers' compensation numbers um, in the years to come, hopefully. Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting point you raise, right? Like, so 10% of the total um, employers in New South Wales, uh, it's a big number, 90,000, right? But that's still 90% then that, you know, you either they, they might have done it right and you just don't have data on it. Um, how, do we get, how do we get it more popular? Uh, as New South Wales, have you guys started to think about the strategy? Like, how do you make this mainstream and not just something that only, uh, like, really, the you know, one in 10 um, that, You've got at least data on that are doing something um, positive in this space. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what we're thinking about the day in and day out, to be mm. honest. As I mentioned, we started with 70% of businesses were not um, doing next to nothing. So mm. we're really pleased to see that the top tier um, starting to, to improve. And we're starting to see a bit of a snowballing effect. It was a fairly slow start to our strategic approach in terms of the first year or two. We, we had internal challenges around um, doing mass media campaigning, for example, and raising awareness of our tools and resources. Plus, we needed time to develop them and, and, and progress them as well. Um, plus, on top of that, we, we didn't have the code of practice or the regulations, um, which we now do. So, again, New South Wales is really pleased to, as of the 1st of October, to, to be the first in the country to, to, um, to launch the, the model of work health and safety regulations. So, we feel like we've got some momentum now, and I think that's what's going to um, help us achieve uh, results over time. So. I like to talk about sort of three main streams that we, we use to try and influence employee behaviour. One is um, a self-service stream. Most businesses want to know um, what to do and how to do it, and, and they're quite motivated to do it because it's the right thing to do. So we've got all the resources in the world, including online tools and, and resources that you guys will be familiar with, accessible to them. We've got a supported service kind of stream, which is our, um, our coaching and training services that we provide, particularly to small and medium businesses. You might have financial resources limitations or or not know where to start and they're fairly low on the, on the capability curve. Um, so we've, we've got that available. We'll continue to do that for next year or two at least. Um, and we also have our regulatory functions. And now that we've defined code of practice, we've defined regulations, we're in a far better position now for the, for the few that, that might need a bit more of a nudge or a bit more of a um, motivation from the regulator. Um, that's where Ian and the team come in and play and we'll, we'll certainly be um, holding to account around the regulations and the code of practice moving forward. Yeah, I think a few is a nice way of, of putting it. Um, uh, I think Ian's going to need a lot more people in his team by the sounds of it. How are you going with your recruitment drive? Um, you know, it seems like there's uh, more and more jobs being advertised every day for psychosocial um, you know, inspectors. I think that's a bit of a challenge across the whole industry, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, inter and like internal functions now going in this area as well. So uh, people are obviously worried about Ian coming and knocking on their doors. And so they're going, well, we need someone to <laughs> that knows their stuff internally. That and, and, and just clinical sites in general, if, you, if you're trying to get to, to see mm. a clinical site, um, whether it be for your, yourself, your family or your children, the, the demand is excessive. Um, the mental health system is under extreme stress and pressure at the moment because of the demand, generally speaking. So um, it's a really tight competitive labour market, but we'll certainly do a shout out to all your listeners if they're interested in a, in a role with a regulator. Um, certainly put their hand up and, and let me know. Um, so we're always proactively looking for the best talent we can attract. Um, and it's such a rewarding career, but I'll let Ian talk about that. He's, he's the one that's been getting the opportunities to take all that on. Yeah. Yeah, Ian, Ian um, yeah, I, I don't think we had that as a, a question necessarily, and we want to get into the meaty stuff in a moment, but um, uh, what sort of uh, skill sets are you looking for in psychosocial inspectors? Um, and, and I just want to preface that by saying we have seen um, a number of roles going for internal um, roles for uh, around psychosocial risk management. Um, a lot of the time they're looking for health professionals, particularly psychologists, and um, some even with uh, are asking for organizational psychologists who are um, accredited, like Joelle is, uh, but they're not lo looking to pay the sort of dollars that these sort of people um, probably should be demanding. Um, but uh, can you maybe clear that up? You know, do people need to be psychologists to work in the psychosocial risk management space? No. Um I don't think in industry uh, necessarily, you know, I guess depending on the context, 
the industry and the size of the business, to, not necessarily, but certainly for the regulator, no, you don't need to be. Um, you know, what a psychosocial inspector um, relies on is probably the, the um, soft skills or, you know, the interpersonal skills to be able to have conversations because it's not a prescriptive uh, piece of legislation. So there will often be, you know, a, a major part of an inspector's role here in New South Wales is to provide advice and build capability as well as the compliance and enforcement side of things, you know. So you need to be able to kind of um, influence to a degree, but you also need to be able to keep good records. Um, definitely um, a health background is an advantage and if it's a psych background, even greater advantage because what you'll be looking for is, is kind of that systems level um, thinking, you know. So um, I guess those disciplines or those sorts of qualifications and training that set you up to understand the prevention space versus, you know, relying solely on an individual kind of health treatment, um, if uh, that makes sense. So, um, yeah, there's a mix of... Um, investigative, uh, in, interpersonal or kind of soft skills, but definitely subject matter knowledge and systems thinking. Um, and you don't have to have the whole package. You know, a lot of it we will teach you. Inspectors get a, a, um, a lot of training. There's a lot of time and effort spent um, training inspectors. So, yeah. And, and yeah. It's, as as Jim said, I, I can't help but mention, we've had some, some moments, you know, working for the regulator where you, you really are at, at the forefront of you know law that's evolving, um, and um, not only you know like the development of codes of practice and when uh, regulations are adopted, but case law, um, you know, you're seeing how to how to apply science into practice around you know uh, mental health within the workplace. So we have had some moments that kind of still talking about it now give me goosebumps. You know, the opportunity to to work with some of the um, greatest minds in the country yeah yeah and i'd say the world as well i think we even mentioned that maybe the first time you're on here and what you guys are doing in new south wales in in many instances is at least in the western world a um a, a world first we know in europe that they've got psycho social risk uh, regulations um that have been around since about 2014 i believe um but definitely what you're doing in terms of comparing to other commonwealth countries like the uk and, and canada you know um it's it's really amazing so yeah no uh, keep up the good work and i think it it's it's it, it would be exciting for someone who has an interest in psych health and safety to work where it's all happening in new south wales definitely look at you plugging the recruitment campaign oh well, uh, the more the more that i will yeah the more the better i think um we uh, i think we've spoken about it before you know we've been trying to carrot for a decade maybe two uh, around workplace mental health going hey look here's the roi that you'll get and here's like you'll make people happy and retain them and all the rest but hasn't moved the needle um so i think we need ian knocking on a few more doors need ian and his stick yeah. you, you picked up on the, on the comment about the few but um generally speaking i think businesses do want to do the right thing they just don't know how to do it they really do lack the capability uh, and also understand the why i suppose why psychological health and safety is, is really important to their businesses um, if you look at the journey we've been through for physical health and safety, we've made fantastic gains in the mm. physical space over the last. Often the, I often quote the, the fatality numbers that we saw in the, in the construction of Sydney Harbour Bridge was was phenomenal. Mm. Um, and you look at the infrastructure we build now, um, and this just completely unacceptable to have serious injuries and illnesses in, in your infrastructure builds now. Um, the journey is still relatively young in the psychological health space, and businesses haven't really recognised that that we have to go down that journey. So. Um, what we've achieved in, in the last five years in terms of creating uh, an environment where businesses are, so 10% of businesses are proactively um, building their capability uh, and also clearly defining what compliance looks like is, is a really positive step um, and, and certainly um, fast-tracking what, what we've been through in the physical space um, for the psychological welfare workers, I think. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, Jim. I don't think any um, employer or very few employer actually would like uh, the the work to cause people to become ill. Um, uh, I think they want to do the most. I think it is more um, yeah ignorance rather than you know trying trying to do the wrong thing or get getting away with with it. Um, we have heard there's a lot of people who in New South Wales even who aren't even aware of the code of practice which has been around for quite a while and we're going to talk about that in a moment as well as the new regs they're not aware of it so. 
there's obviously a lot more education. Um, some good uh, public cases and maybe some directors being held liable would uh, would probably help speed up the education process, though, I would think. It might do. Yeah. yeah. It might do. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about the code of practice then. So um, managing psychosocial hazards at work, um, that's been out for more than a year now. Um, how has it been received in New South Wales businesses? I'd, to be honest, be really overwhelmed by how well it's been received. Um, to, when we launch codes of practice in specific industries or sectors, you always get criticism. It's very hard to please everyone. And, and most codes of practice we deliver are really in discrete industries. So construction, for example, has, has a wealth of codes of practice and, and they're quite narrow around scaffolding or um, high-risk plan, that kind of thing. Uh, even when you deliver those in a narrow focus, you get criticism. But when we embarked on this journey for the code of practice for psychosocial has in all industries that impacts on all workers, we thought we were in for a really rough time. Uh, and we did. We had some bumpy periods along the way in terms of consultation and stakeholder engagement. But where we landed, um, overwhelming um, positive feedback from from all the different perspectives in terms of academics, industry, and and worker representatives. It's been really, really well received, which I think just shows the, the maturity of the community um, and where they're at, in that they are crying out for, for clear guidance and clear direction in terms of how to do this. Um, and it's not not dispute employers aren't saying this is not not reasonable not practical but they actually they actually accept the fact that this is where we're heading and this is what they need to to do it and you you had a lot of it firsthand yeah i'd agree with that jim i think um pleasantly surprised you know myself um i think i guess what prompted us to kind of go down this path um could be a factor in you know why it was so well received because we were really looking at trying to address some of the pain points for businesses you know what they were telling us they were struggling with there was some confusion around how to apply the broad duties under the act to the to uh, uh, managing the risk of psychosocial hazards so you know we were hearing there's some confusion we need more clarity and there's even some anxiety around this so i think a lot of uh, industry and worker representatives agreed that there was a need for it. And I think that, you know, really helped. But also we did spend quite a bit of time in public consultation. You know, we were really serious about trying to identify what are the main areas that you need our help with. Um, and elevating it, it, it's not new, is it? You know, what's in the code of practice wasn't new. There's plenty of guidance around, really good guidance here in Australia um, and and overseas that, that kind of wasn't so... The content of the code isn't new, but just that important step of ele elevating it from the level of guidance material in the legislative framework to, well, this is a practical guide, this is what compliance looks like, and this is what's going to be considered reasonably practicable, was enough, I, th I think, for like a lot of our customers to go, okay, um, now we know where we need to start. Um, it, it's been it's been really positively received, as Jim said, and and. You know, we spent probably the first 12 months, so it was, was adopted in New South Wales in May last year, and we spent the first 12 months kind of running public um, inf information sessions. So it wasn't so much of the practical stuff in this uh, early stage. We were trying to raise awareness. And, you know, some of the survey results from those sessions um, really confirmed for us that businesses uh, um, have an, an increased understanding around their duties um, after learning about the code. Um, around the risk management process. Um, you know, we asked them um, questions around what are the barriers within their workplace? You know, what else do they need? What other resources do they need? So um, what we were really pleased with uh, was that the level of understanding, you know, after looking at the code, the level of understanding around duties and the risk management process and what are psychosocial hazards seemed to be in increasing. Um, and also businesses were telling us that they were starting to think about, you know, what are the barriers? Um, what else do we need? What other resources do we need within our workplace? And what's our next step? So, yeah, it was really pleasing. Well, that's um, fantastic to hear. Um, and I think pr probably because psychosocial hazards are, I think, yeah, unless unless you do have some training in in that area or some education about it, it is really quite a foreign concept to um, to a lot of people um, until you actually start to explain what it is and then everybody goes, oh, yeah, I've experienced that and I understand how that works. 
Um, so I could see how um, that would help to putting putting something practical together like that would even just help to allay some people's fears around this, you know, what seems like a really scary concept because you're talking about mental health, but when you're framing it in that um, that model of, you know, hazards and, and mitigations, um, it just puts it into um, a, a mental model that is um, – much easier for people to understand and it, it I think takes a lot of that fear um, out of the equation for them. Yeah and we stayed true to the scope of the work health and safety legislation you know we we really resisted um, some of the calls to kind of go into uh, injury management you know can you provide some more information around managing injury and we're, no this is we, we really want to make it clear this is about how to comply with the work health and safety framework um, and I think we really needed to do that but we also drew a line in the sand around terminology too um, as you just mentioned Joel so you know making it really clear um, where this fits within a business um, you know uh, what sort of terminology needs to be used um, and it, the bottom line is this you know this is what an inspector is going to come looking for um, so there's no surprises yeah mm. and just I guess to um, catch on to that point that you made about um, rehabilitation um, do you have are there plans to develop some sort of guidance around uh, sort of psychosocial injury rehabilitation return to work um, that kind of thing in a similar vein? Not from Safe Work New South Wales perspective. Um, you know, it, it's probably more led by the insurance regulator or the insurers um, in New South Wales. That's probably their domain. But we certainly play a role in supporting and assisting them and, and looking for alignment um, across those um, because they, they obviously go hand in hand prevention and recovery are really key. But um, I think as Ian touched on, we what we needed was clear defines what health and safety legislation requires. And, um, and by sticking to our lane and, and keeping those parameters really tight enabled us to get something that was acceptable to all parties across the line. Yeah. Um, I think you touched on the word fear a little bit too, Joelle. And in this space, there was a lot of fear and a little anxiety, particularly from the employer groups, about are you expecting us to manage things that are outside our control? Um, I think that's something that the team did really well at, at again, defining the scope and making sure there was evidence behind the psychosocial hazards that we identified um, that are clearly within the control uh, of the, the workplace and, and the employer. Um, we, we don't expect um, employers to control um, what people do outside their work, work environment um, or their work hours, but these hazards um, are indisputed now, um, 12 months down the track, no one's, no one's challenges to say that these psych hazards are within the control of the workplace. And, and by leaning on that and making sure we got that right, I think it's, it's why this has been such a, a pretty successful code of practice. Yeah, and I think that it's, um, you know, it's easy to show that, you know, people are also exposed to physical hazards outside of work, you know, like somebody might like to do rock climbing or base jumping in their, in their free time. That doesn't mean that we don't give them full protection when they're exposed to a high risk at work. Um, and when you frame it in, in that context, I think that helps a lot of people get over that, um, that particular mental barrier around, well, how do we know? Because, you know, this could be coming from home. Um, I think even the title, Ian, um, was a real challenge. You can probably talk to that better than I can. Yeah, it, it was one of, you know, we spent a lot of time, as I said, in um, public consultation and, and had, you know, well over 50 meetings with key um, stakeholder groups, you know, um, experts, uh, industry, uh, worker representatives. So we did spend a lot of time going through some of these issues and, and um, you know, at first, with our first draft, we kind of went out with a title around managing risks to um, psychological health because the legislation talks about health being defined as physical and psychological and it's risk-based legislation. But what, what we heard back was um, it was actually increasing anxiety because even just using that term, a lot of businesses were interpreting that as, well, risk for, risks to somebody's psychological health can come from outside work. Um, so, you know, we really backtracked there and, and um, sat down with um, some some of the great minds around um, organisational psych uh, here in Australia and, and really pegged it back to be really, you know, clear work health and safety language. Yeah. And so um, you've said it, it's been received well so far. Um, what approach have you been or are you continuing to take um, in terms of both raising awareness and ensuring compliance 
Yeah, the focus has really been on raising awareness and, and it has been throughout the whole strategy journey. So raising awareness initially without the code of practice was around best practice and, and how to create a mentally healthy work environment. Then it shifted around well, what does compliance look like and the code of practice was part of the answer to that in terms of raising awareness and, and making businesses aware that we've got tools and resources to help you do this, but we also now clearly define it through the code of practice. Uh, and, and the numbers and, and the, um, the reach and the attention that we've been getting through, through our forums has been really, really positive for the code of practice in the last 12, 18 months. And now we've got the regulations, um, which which has come on in New South Wales fairly quickly, even from model legislation and the model reg recommendations came about. But um, in hindsight, we, we probably would have preferred the regulations to, to lead and the code of practice to follow. But the way it's worked out has been really interesting. Is, um, obviously, we're committed to the national harmonisation model. New South Wales has been um, quite... Um, quite stringent in trying to stick to the harmonisation model wherever, wherever possible. Uh, and that's delayed the process and it certainly made it more difficult for any act or reg changes. And that's why we went alone with the code of practice and, and thought that's something we can control and influence and we need to get on with doing this. But by doing so, it's certainly prepared New South Wales businesses for what the regulations require them to do. So part of our messaging now with the regulations out is um, if you comply with the code, you comply with the reg. Um, we, we anticipated the regulations coming uh, the detail that you put in the code of practice really meets your obligations around the regulations. Um, so collectively now we're, we're on a bit of a roadshow to raise awareness and build capability around those. Um, that will probably be the focus for the next 12 months in, in a large way. Uh, and then we'll probably shift more towards um, some kind of compliance activity focusing on those highest risk industries. So can you maybe, um, with, I guess, without um, giving away... Um secret squirrel business um can you give us some insight into what that process looks like sort of what would actually trigger an inspection um uh, in, in relation to psychosocial hazards what are the different um steps enforcement steps that you're able to take and sort of how what does that look like Ian, you can leave this one. yeah thanks jim um i love talking about this so you might have to put the brakes on me um it's and an inspector has a lot of discretion, particularly, you, you know, uh, under the harmonised legislation. But um, here in New here in New South Wales, our inspectors are trained to be able to give advice as well as um, enforce compliance. Um, as I said, so what it looks like from from a regulator's perspective, um, matters are brought to our attention, often kind of by two two main pathways when it comes to our responsive work. So people can if if people can ask for um, advisory functions like a um, presentation within their workplace. Um, but in terms of the responsive, you know, the complaint related um, element, there's two main pathways. One is, is the complaint or in New South Wales, what we call a request for service and they're triage based on, um, you know, the level of risk. Um, and the other is an incident, so um, notifiable incident. So, you know, many of your work health and safety um, professionals within the audience will be quite familiar with that part of the legislation. So they're the two main ways. Um, they're obviously triaged, um, you know, and um, decisions are made around, around the level of our response. Um, and then through the inspection process or the response process, um, we make decisions around what's the appropriate um, What's the appropriate um, reaction from us? You know, is is it that we should um, provide advice only? You know, that that, that that there probably isn't a great role for us here, um, or if an inspector starts to form a reasonable belief that there has been or could be a contravention of the act, they can think about a notice and an improvement notice. You know, or or if it's quite a serious situation, um, we can start to think about whether there needs to be. A full investigation. Um, Jim, have I summed up? Yeah, project? definitely. Um, I think there's, there's in the psych space, there's, there's typically two types of incidents what we might see. One is a sort of a one off traumatic style of incident. So think of occupational violence um, in the workplace, which um, traditionally has obviously physical and psychological implications. Um, they're a little bit easier, I suppose, to get first hand. Um, Evidence we can notify it in a timely way for starters, which makes it a lot easier as a regulator. Uh, we go out and we gather evidence around what, what happened in terms of that incident, uh, and that forms um, our prima facie evidence as we, we talk about. Uh, we then consider obviously the public interest and whether or not there is a public interest in pursuing that matter any further. Um, and we also consider obviously our prospects for success of, of, of succeeding if we do choose to take that beyond an improvement notice or a prohibition notice through to a potential prosecution. 
Uh, traditionally, we, we, we've done pretty well in those in that regard, and um, and then a more recent outcome for us was a um, enforceable undertaking that we entered into with with one of the New South Wales Health government organisations, um, where there was a serious violence incident at a hospital facility, uh, where people, three people were, were seriously injured, and, and obviously others were exposed to the trauma of that particular incident. Um, that was a three million dollar enforceable undertaking, uh, where the the health department essentially going to invest substantially in improving health and safety outcomes uh, around occupational violence in the, in the healthcare sector. So that's that's a really recent outcome for us, which we're really proud of, and, and it will make a significant difference in that particular industry sector. The other one is really around those long-term exposures um, to psychosocial hazards that we've obviously called out in the code of practice, and and they're more challenging to gather evidence, and particularly the prima facie evidence that we need to gather. Uh, so typically, bullying is often one of the first things that will come to us as a regular. We, we get lots of inquiries and complaints about bullying. And, and bullying is, um, I like to say, and I think it tends to agree, is, it's a bit of a symptom of an underlying problem. Um, it's not necessarily the problem itself. And if you, you dig a bit deeper, you can work out, well, is the, the, the person who's being alleged to be bullying under extreme high job demands, for example, um, have they got insufficient training and resources to do their job effectively so that that's resulting in poor communication and, and poor behaviour towards others in the workplace? And, and potential that interpersonal conflict. Um, is there role conflict issues between the two parties? And is that why they're, they're conflicting and, and causing some of the bullying type behaviours? And, and then you can start to identify what those psychosocial hazards are that, that um, exist in the organisation. And, and if we can build substantial evidence around that, then that's when we will start to consider further investigation and, and, and a bit of prosecution. And, and we do need to weigh up, obviously, um, the, the public interest and whether it's worth our while to invest our significant resources that it takes to get the matter through to court. But we also need to weigh up um, the reasonable prospects as well. And you know, obviously with limited case law in this space, uh, we do spend a lot of time with our, our legal professionals um, to weigh up the pros and cons of pursuing a matter and making sure that if we do take a matter to court, it's, it's highly likely of succeeding. Because we do want to set out some case law that's going to stick for the, for the long, long haul, I think. Yeah, definitely. And so an enforceable undertaking, can is that only an option post-prosecution? It's in lieu of prosecution. So right, uh, when yeah. we get to the point of laying charges, uh, there's an opportunity for the person conducting the business undertaking uh, to put forward a, a submission to, to request an enforceable undertaking. And we have an independent panel of a number of providers, both Safe Work and others, involved in that panel that will consider their eligibility. Uh, and then they'll start the process of building an argument up for, for why that particular undertaking should be accepted. Um, the, the intention is really that they go above and beyond what they would get in terms of financial penalty. Um, mm. because they need to accept a level of responsibility. They also need to uh, outline clearly what they're doing internally to, to resolve the problem, which they should have already resolved before they get to that point, uh, what they can do for the industry, what they can do for the community, um, above and beyond what we would normally expect them to do. So we can get some great health and safety outcomes from enforcement undertaking. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to consider, again, that reasonable prospect. So if there's any doubt in terms of us pursuing a matter in prosecution, enforcement undertakings can be quite appealing to us. Uh, but even if there's not the doubt, then perhaps um, an enforcement undertaking can achieve a better um, outcome and, and more raise more awareness of the compliance activities um, that we want to achieve anyway. So it's a real strategic decision that the regulator has to make and, and sometimes they get accepted, sometimes they don't. And they, are they published on your webpage? Yes, all the enforcement undertakings, once they've been approved, um, are published and, and shared quite publicly. Yep, fantastic. So um, listeners who are interested in um, having a look at that um that one that you were just mentioning, uh, they can find that on your webpage. Fantastic. So um, as you were talking about uh, there, Jim, um, the regulation, sorry, the code of practice there is to support the regulations that uh, New South Wales has jumped out in front and been the first to uh, adopt. Um, so can you maybe either you or Ian explain how the regulations and the code of practice talk to each other? And then what does the new regulations mean for PCPUs operating in New South Wales? It sounds like a state inspector question for me. Yeah, no worries. Um, was it, 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 um, it, many of your listeners may be familiar with the uh, legislative framework in um, pyramid form, you know, where um, at the pointy end, right at the top, there's the uh, Work Health and Safety Act. The next level down is the Work Health and Safety Regulations. Then that third level is kind of codes of practice standards. And then the um, bottom tier in that framework is guidance. And 
the top three are quite important from a legal perspective. Obviously, the Act sets out the broad duties, um, tells you that you that you have a duty, and it's quite broad. Then the reg starts to really pick out certain hazards and certain situations and breaks down what steps you need to be aware of. And then the purpose of a code of practice is to provide, um, provide the more practical um, understanding and, and kind of set that standard. You, in New South Wales, you don't have to rely strictly on our code of practice. You can use another method. You know, you can rely on uh, ISO 45003 or the UK or Canadian um, assessments, but you still need to meet that uh, minimum standard set in the code of practice because mm -hmm. they can be used by an inspector when they're thinking about improvement notices, but they can also be used as evidence in a legal proceeding of what's reasonably practicable. So, you know, what you should know, um, what you should be doing. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's almost like a um, cookbook, you know, where you've got the recipe and the method um, working your way through that framework. I could just don't break out um, cake and icing. I think that's uh, copyright. I, I, I stopped myself sh short. I, I'll leave that to Carlo. He does it so much better than, than anyone else. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So um, with the, uh, the new regs being adopted by New South Wales, uh, which includes now um, specific regulations around psychosocial risk, um, what does this mean for PCBUs then? So important features of the regs, I, th I think some of the key messages um, the regs defines what is a psychosocial hazard. So um, clearly in the legal terms, so in the legislative framework, Work Health and Safety Act defines health as both physical and, and psychological. And then the reg says, so this is what a psych hazard is. Um, and it's about four points um, in the regs. It talks about things like um, workplace behaviour, um, management, of work so nothing new but it's just now formalized in the regulations and then it goes on to clarify formally what what a uh, psychosocial risk is and basically it's the risk to the work health and safety of your workers or others on site uh, and then it clarifies that as a business you do have a duty to manage these risks uh, and then interestingly it, it it um, moves on to what you need to consider when you're implementing control measures. So makes the point that you need to attempt to eliminate, and if that's not reasonably practicable, then minimise. So it's kind of confirming what's already in the Act. Um, and often with psychosocial hazards, it is not possible to eliminate. Uh, and then it moves on to what you need to consider when you're implementing or um, thinking about control measures. And that's things... I, I don't think there's any surprises there either. It's things like um, e exposure, um, severity, which is basically your uh, risk assessment. You know, and then it talks about things like the design of work, uh, the way work is managed, supported, talks about the work environment, um, workplace behaviour, uh, interactions. Um, so it's, it's nothing new. Um, it's just now formalised um, in the regulations and what's in the code of practice um, really aligns well with that. One thing that's probably worth noting is the regulations refers the duty holder back to part 3.1 of the model regs, which is the general requirement to manage risk, but it excludes clause 36, which is that you must apply the hierarchy of control. Mm. Um, so that list in uh, section 55 um, that unpacks for you what you need to consider is almost in, in lieu of having to formally apply the hierarchy of control. They're the same principles. Hmm. Um, and then the um, code of practice, that's the same approach that we took in the code. We didn't specify that you had to apply the hierarchy of control in the in the uh, New South Wales code either. Um, yeah. Well, one Jason. thing... Um uh, sorry, um, Jim, one, one moment. So one thing that I thought was interesting in the regs, which has now actually been picked up in the model regs from Safe, uh, sorry, from um, Safe Work Australia, is when considering exposure, you must consider severity, frequency and duration of, of exposure to stress. Um, so that, that was quite interesting because that wasn't uh, articulated in your code of practice in New South Wales, was it? No, we had feedback um, and, and it was pretty consistent from worker industry and academic um, experts just to to soften or, or um, 
perhaps have a, a rethink about some of the language that we were using when we were trying to articulate exposure and um, assessment of risk. So yeah, we did we did take a more practical approach to the terminology within the code, um, and it was very much you know we were being asked and 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 we were conscious of trying to provide as much information as possible about the process that you should follow. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting though, because I think there still then is some confusion about, you know, say um, something like an employee engagement survey, you know, is that an assessment of risk? Um, so without understanding, well, to understand risk, we need to understand severity, frequency and duration of exposure to stress to, to come up with the likelihood and consequence of harm. Um, I think it does kind of leave some gray and some people not quite sure. So um, I think there's still some room for improvement <laughs> in the code, but I'm glad the regs have picked it up anyway, which obviously is the uh, overarching piece of legislation. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry, Jim. Yeah, Jason, I was just going to say, I'm conscious that your listeners are obviously across Australia and internationally. Um, so what we're talking about here is really what we've adopted in New South Wales, but I do want to call out that in parallel to us developing our strategy and our code of practice, uh, we were working with the national um, regulators across the, across the country for Australia, uh, and that's when we, we worked on the, the model code of practice, uh, and we also worked on the, on the model regulations as they developed over time, uh, and, and the, the Marie Boland review of the, the work on the safety legislation. So one thing that's, that's really worth noting is that whilst um, we're not entirely harmonised, there's lots of different states that are looking at codes of practice and different versions of it, um, and whilst we adopted the model regulations here in New South Wales, some states are looking at slight deviations on those regulations as they they prepare to, to roll them out in their states. The general um, consistency is, is really, really strong. Um, so there's only some subtle differences between states and jurisdictions in terms of what they currently have and what they will, will have in the future. The little things like the high ranking controls is, 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 a, is a good example where um, we've chosen not to adopt the hierarchy uh, in our um, regulations for code of practice and the model regulations didn't choose to, but other jurisdictions are looking at doing that. And, and there's an argument that hierarchy controls is a familiar um, term and a familiar uh, approach to risk management uh, for those who've been doing psychological, uh, physical health and safety for many years. Um, and there's another argument that it creates confusion in the psychological health space and we kind of fell on that side of the, of the fence. Um, but generally speaking, um, eliminating the risk and, and doing what's reasonable practical to control the risk is, is the, the fundamental commitment that all yeah. jurisdictions are sticking behind. So really important to listeners understand there are some subtle differences, um, but generally speaking, we're all pretty much aligned. Yeah, definitely the regulators that we've spoken to about this, they're all um, very much putting out, you should be seeking to eliminate first. Um, and then you should be seeking at least, if not talking to directly to the hierarchy of controls saying higher order controls as in job redesign rather than just going straight to policy and training uh, to deal Absolutely. with psychosis. So yeah, even without a hierarchy of controls, it's you know pretty easy to go. Yeah, we, we understand that. Yeah, we've got to yep. design as close to the root cause, design out the risk as close to the root cause as possible. That's it. And you won't get any objection from any other jurisdictions about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask the question, but I won't because it will get cut out if I ask the question anyway. Um, about when do you think Victoria will join the harmonised workplace health and safety legislation? Just make, <laughs> make things easy for everyone. Um, we'll just get our crystal ball out. And <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I didn't ask, just to put it out there. I didn't ask that question. I'll, I'll, said, I'll, I'll answer and say never. Okay. All right. And that's that's my hot tip. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I must have just uh, dropped out there for a sec. I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So looking into um, sort of 2023 and beyond, um, what are your plans from, from Safe Work New South Wales? Well, I've got some pretty ambitious little plans myself. Um, that I've been, I, I probably would have liked to have done five years ago, but I don't think we were quite ready as a, as a state and as a community to take it on. And, I would, and clearly we had a lot of work to do in the psychological health and safety space first and foremost. But, but traditionally we've talked about safety and, and most businesses um, the, the untrained um, workplaces out there think of safety in the physical context and i think of the psychological context and i think five years down the track um, people are starting to talk about mental health and psychological safety which is fantastic um, they're also starting to talk about psychological psychosocial hazards in the workplace thanks to the code, code of practice regs and things like that as well my vision for the future is really when we talk about health and safety we're talking about physical and psychological health um, I'm also very conscious that the way we work and, and where we work is changing 
all the time with, with things like big gig economy, with things like people working from home, um, working remote and isolated locations. So my real vision for the future is, is around healthy work and, and healthy work being designed to be both physically and psychologically healthy and safe is, is really where I want to see us, us move towards. There's obviously limitations to what we can and can't do through regulation and compliance around that, but that's really kind of best practice vision towards healthy workplaces. And, and that's certainly what we'll be talking about moving forward to and, and we'll launch you something in the next month or two to start the conversation around healthy work um, and, and keeping that holistic perspective because we know physical and psychological health go hand in hand. We, we, we don't separate ourselves from our work and home life anymore. We're very much... Um, integrated, I suppose, in our, in our lifestyle. So that's that's the conversation we need to be having in workplaces and that's kind of where I want to see things move towards the future. Fantastic. So really looking at, yeah, get, getting people to a state where when we talk about health and safety, psychological health and safety is just part of that um, r- rather than having to remind them that, yeah, this also includes uh, mental health. Yes. Uh, and recognise nice. the fact that when people come to work, they, they bring their full selves to work. So if they've had a bad night's sleep, if they're, they're suffering with um, illness and disease outside of the workplace, whether it be physical or psychological, you need to take the consideration before you ask them to do a particular work task that, that may place them at risk of physical injury. Um, if you're impaired by drugs, alcohol, or fatigue, you're more likely to fall off a roof, for example. Um, but if you're impaired by drugs, alcohol, or fatigue, perhaps you need to look at what the workplace contribution might be to that. Are you a fly and fly at worker and you're drinking? After work every day because of the high job demands you're under and the long 12 hour shifts that you're working back to back. Um, having that conversation so that you can look, look at the work, the impact work is having on your health and, and the state of your health um, and how that can impact on work. I think that's really where we want to be in the future. Yeah, and I, um, that just highlights a point for me as well that, you know, I think a lot of the time organizations will view things like, um, you know, family conflict. Um, divorce you know um insomnia those types of things as personal matters um but a lot of the time those personal matters are caused or exacerbated by things that are happening at work so you know there's i think plenty of people who have gone through a divorce and then look back and said well yeah my job was sort of the primary reason for that because of the the long hours that i worked or you know the stresses that i was experiencing at work and then i was bringing it home and taking it out on the family um or i was too fatigued to be able to participate in my family life and and that sort of thing. So I think that recognising that the two really are intertwined, um, whether we're sort of doing hybrid work or whether we are still separating our home, being physically at home from being physically in the office, um, in our brains, those two things do uh, certainly interact and impact on each other. Absolutely. And, and I think we, we certainly have to ask the question, well, what is the role of the workplace having on those things outside of work? But also, even if it has no contribution at all to the to the marriage breakdown or family issues, what impact is that having on their performance at work? And, and is that putting them at a greater risk of, of physical injury, perhaps, um, or, or further psychological injury? So they're bound to be distracted by those factors outside of work, and you need to consider that as part of your, your risk assessment. Yeah, in the same way that you would if they'd been playing footy on the weekend and, and injured their back or something. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, Jim, you've already spoken about some of your aspirations for the future. So, uh, Ian, we, we've asked you previously about what are your hopes for the future of, of workplace mental health? Have they uh, been updated in the last year since we, we last had you on? Oh, I have to admit, I can't remember what I said. Um, I'd have to go I'm back sure myself, you- Ian. We've had a few <laughs> between, yeah. between drinks. So, yeah. I'm sure he said he wanted to get the first psychological regulations in the country across the line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think, it, yeah, it was something competitive to that nature, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to be first. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think I think what I'd like to, like to be doing in, in, you know, five to ten years when we're talking about workplace mental health is probably having conversations around, you know, what supports a systematic approach or, or a preventative approach. So things like um, principles of... Um, uh, process evaluation, uh, readiness for change, you know, some of those um, kind of boundary factors. Um, I'd like to kind of think that um, 
Jim and I, we're having discussions around those in five to 10 years. So that's, that's kind of, you know, more broadly around workplace mental health. If I can rein it in a bit and, and I guess tighten the scope and think about regulation. Um, at the moment, what we're seeing with the code of practices that are, um, that are um, coming out around the country and the um, model regs, obviously, um, we're seeing a lot more conversations around the first two phases of the risk management process, you know, how to identify and assess the risk, and that's really pleasing. But, you know, in five or ten years, I'd love it if I, if we were having conversations around which control measures um, had more evidence um, and, you know, what. this is how I came up with my decision that what I've done is reasonably practicable. So I'd really love to see the kind of put my inspector hat on. I'd love to be talking about evidence-informed controls and how we make decisions around what's um, reasonably practicable. Yeah. Yeah. That's, we're, uh, um, we're working on that. <laughs> we are working on that. <laughs> We, we should find a regulator that wants to work with us on that, Joel. That's, That'd be, uh, wouldn't that be something? Yeah, I reckon Victoria. Wink, I reckon. Wink. I reckon Victoria. Would be they might. They might. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> think. But well, I agree. So we we need to get better at understanding and helping employers understand the real risk. So what is the actual human and business risk of not dealing with psychosocial hazards? Um, but then we need to be giving them very clear evidence of well, if this is. This is the situation, this is the industry, this is the role. If you do this, this is how much that risk will be reduced. Um, that's all we need to get to. And that's definitely our three to five year ambition as well, that we have data to support that. So, yeah, no, I like it. Definitely. You can, um, no, I'm not going to try and recruit Ian from uh, South New South Wales. <laughs> I try. <laughs> not, with, not, with, not with Jim on the call. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Rude. <laughs> All right. So um, our final question for each of you, uh, what words of advice do you have for listeners who are interested in working in psych health and safety? There's no better time than the present um, to really to chase this, um, this career path, I think. As we mentioned before, the labour market is really, really short. We're crying out for expertise, um, both in industry and regulation and um, and all their aspects of psychological health and safety. So now's a really good time to pursue that career and aspiration and and be bold and be confident and, and, and reach out to your leaders in your organisations and, and, and create the role. Um, talk to them about health and safety. There's tools that are freely available on our website and others um, that enable you to start your journey towards psychological health and safety where you can actually implement tools that have been tried and tested and evidence-based um, that are validated by the regulator um, that enable you to drive a conversation with your business leaders. So that's a great way to start your, your career down the psychology and safety space if you're not already doing so. If you are, if you're trained and qualified and experienced in this place, then it's a, another great opportunity to, to amplify your career and, and really step it up a notch because because um, people are listening, businesses are listening. Um, we're driving businesses to listen um, to psychological health and safety expertise, so we'd like to see that progress moving forward. Thank you very much. And um, Ian, anything to add? I'd probably only um, reinforce, consider the regulator. Um, like, we, you know, <laughs> some of the some of the things that are happening at the moment, as Jim said, it's an incredibly exciting time. And I think COVID has just added, you know, extra momentum to this space. So there's a lot of things happening legally and in terms of research. Um, and that's all going to be really unfolding, you know, in a few years' time. Um, yeah, so seriously, consider the regulator. You can have such reach, um, you know, more than kind of one client at a time. You can really have great reach um, working for the regulator and thinking about policy and strategy and guidance documents. And yeah, yeah plus, you know, plus you also get the moral high ground. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, the other thing I'll throw in on that is that, like you said, there's a, a, a very uh, large amount of training and development that goes into inspectors. Um, and even if you're not a psychologist, if you're a health and safety person, it brings systems thinking to the role. Um, you'd probably flourish in that. Um, but you could treat it, you maybe do it like the army. You know, it's a three year kind of sign on. We will develop you and then you can go earn the big bucks in private. <laughs> I don't know. You know what though? We've seen the salaries for private and I think you guys might actually have a better salary potentially. Um, so just putting it out there, like uh, yeah, either. I think it's people need to be paying their psychosocial people um, more anyway yeah. <laughs> across the board. Um, um, but I think, uh, yeah, if you're new and you want to, you know, get in on this growing area, you know, there's probably no better place to learn that than an inspector like Joel did. Yeah, and I <laughs> would say that my my time spent um, with Nopsema, I learned a phenomenal amount about 
just yeah sort of safety management systems approaches to to risk management um that sort of thing that you know i'm then able to apply to a psychosocial context with my psych background um so that yeah that time for me was invaluable um, as far as learning and learning from a group of people who are just phenomenally um, knowledgeable and, and skilled in the work that they do as well. So, yeah, I, I support uh, what you're saying there. And, um, yeah, people should definitely look at the regulator. Yeah, and just for those in uh, private and government um, uh, organisations that are looking to recruit in this space as well, um, just to be clear, you don't need a psychologist. Psychologists do not cover health and safety as part of their their training. Um, they need to pick that up through exposure um, in industry or, you know, in practice like Joelle did. Um, yep. So, um, yes. If Yeah, if you're hiring a psychologist, don't assume that they're going to be able to do psych health and safety. Um, they need to have an understanding of safety and risk management models, um, yeah, sort of systems theory, that, that type of thing. And if you want a psychologist who knows that, then you need an org psych and then you need to pay a lot more than what you're paying. For. Sure do. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, really yes. I think they're really valid points because um, you, you don't want to paint a picture that you have to be a clinical psychologist or even an organisational psychologist to, to implement these strategies in the workplace. Um, we want business leaders, um, regardless of, of their background, to be able to implement simple um, risk management principles using psychosocial hazards and, and things like the code of practice as, as a tool to do that. Um, effective consultation in the workplace um, it is key to health and safety, regardless of physical or psychological health probably more important than ever in psychological health. Um, and obviously, um, working with your workers to come up with the solutions, um, that, that's what it really comes back down to. And, um, <clears throat> engaging with the experts when you need to engage with experts, but um, but you don't have to be an expert to do this. I think that's a really important message. And especially, um, especially for psych hazards, I think that, you know, the controls, identifying what, what are going to be effective controls really do lie in the quality of the consultation that you're doing with the workforce because that's where you're actually understanding what what are the root causes that are driving these hazards in the first place. It's, you know, it's very different to something like a height hazard or a, a chemical hazard where, you know, the, the cause and effect are quite um, clearly understood um, and there's not a lot of, yeah, moderating, mediating variables in place. Um, yeah, psych hazards are just a lot more complex and, and you really do need to be able to consult with your workforce um, in, yeah, in really good depth to be able to come up with those controls that are going to be effective. All right, enough on the recruiting campaign for Safe Work New South Wales. I think yeah. we could turn that into a clip, give it to Ian and Jim and they can use it for the recruiting campaign. And they can yeah. give us a finder's fee for anyone. <laughs> well. Yeah, yeah, we should, we, yeah, a Flourish TX recruiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Um, hey guys, um, it's been a really brilliant discussion. Um, wouldn't have thought of it like it would be anything less. So I'm um, really thankful to both of you for coming on and, and really unpacking all the, all the exciting things that you're doing in New South Wales. Thanks, Jason and Joe. It's great to um, for you to have both of us on today. It's been fantastic to be able to share New South Wales' journey. I think over the last five years, and I uh, yeah, really enjoyed chatting with you. Cheers, guys. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Um, so just remember, we do record these over the video uh, Zoom when we do record. So you can check that out on the Flourish DX YouTube channel if you prefer to watch rather than listen. Um, we also will be taking some of the best clips from this uh, discussion and Joe will have a few to choose from again uh, and be putting them on the Flourish DX LinkedIn page. Uh, while you're on LinkedIn, you'll find that um, Joel and I are pretty active over there. So feel free to slide into our DMs if you want to continue the conversation. And uh, yeah, if you want a job working with Safe Work New South Wales, hit up Jim or uh, Ian over there. They frequent uh, LinkedIn probably more than their employer would like them to as well. So <laughs> um, thanks, thanks uh, again, listeners. We'll catch you next episode. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention, follow Flourish DX on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com.